All right, so uh, we have our planning for today, so we'll give you guys a second to input that. So, Mustard, I'd like you to kick us off. Um, so, how is it that Hannah modifies what we learned in Guaranteed Trust? And there, there is an excerpt from the opinion in the question uh, in your book, if that's helpful. And oh, I did. There's another question where like there's a long excerpt attached to the question, and I just said, see the book. Um, but for this one, I gave you the excerpt. So Ms. Ms. Mustard, please interpret this language for us. It's so essentially there to be an eerie type ruling. The um, federal law must um, substantially, sufficiently, sufficiently substantial in interfering with the state. How substantial does it have to be, Ms. Mustard? Um, that it would create an equal protection problem. And in what way would it create an equal protection problem? Uh, if it was outcome determinative in the state court, it would have been decided differently. But again, right, we, we keep coming back to this notion that if the only issue right, is that the outcome changes, then any variation could be outcome determinative if it is sort of the crux issue, right? Even to the point of, do you have to serve someone by hand or can you serve them at their residence, which is of course the issue in this case, right? So, what is it about our about the outcome determinative test that Hannah modifies? Right? What are we looking for to say yes? This is enough outcome determinative. Yeah, Mr. Adams. Are we looking for a direct conflict of law? Is that what the Hannah court says? Not entirely. It's more like. Well, then what? I mean, because we're talking about Hannah. So, what does the court say in Hannah? We're going to get to direct conflicts later. But what are we saying in this case? It needs to be like a direct. It needs to be a substantial drawback to having gone through federal court, as opposed to being just a procedural difference or form difference. So that helps, right? But again, we're still left with like. How substantial do we have to be, right? Ms. Caballeros, did I see your hand? Um, I, I put down here it's substantial enough to alter your state created right. But by that standard, again, like 
where's the line? <coughs> like, what is what is something that is substantial enough that it changes your state created rights? How do we determine whether that standard has been met? Mr. Strummer. I put something in regards to uh, it'll affect your choice of form chopping. So if you're not going to go to another state, it's not really substantial in, in the sense that you wouldn't do that. I mean, if, there, if there's a choice of law, like if you're going to go here instead of here because of the outcome determinativeness of it, then it's not substantial enough. So I think I may have misunderstood what so you So it's substantial enough if it would create or would make you have to have a decision of where am I going to file it? If it's going to create a scenario of form shock. Right. Okay. Now, I, I, I thought I, I, I misheard what you said, and I thought you were saying that um, if it created forum shopping, then that wasn't substantial enough. And I was like, wait, <laughs> but that's but what you just said is exactly right. Okay. So, um, so yeah, Hannah modifies the outcome determinative test to raise the focus, to raise the importance of forum shopping, okay? In that when you file your lawsuit, do you anticipate that the method of service is going to determine whether you win or lose? Like is that do, do, is that something that a plaintiff foresees being a problem? Mr. Gonzalez, you you're shaking your head. Why? I would assume you would find that as a problem just because uh, most people would assume that when you hire a processor, the processor is familiar with the state's requirements. Right. Exactly right. When you file a lawsuit. You operate on you are operating under the assumption that you are going to perfect service uh, <clears throat> adequately under the rules, right? Um, and so absolutely right. Issues that are not foreseeable at the time of filing as being outcome determinative will not trigger the Erie Doctrine under Hannah. Okay? Can you repeat that one more time? Sure. Issues that cannot be foreseen, that are not foreseeable as outcome determinative at the time of filing will not trigger the Erie Doctrine under Hannah because they are not outcome determinative. Because think about it like this, right? Once you are in a forum, you have chosen that the federal forum, right? Of course, because if you're in if you're in a state court, you, the Erie Doctrine doesn't matter. Um, but once you have chosen the federal forum, things that, you know, issues are going to arise, but some of them will not be issues that could have been foreseen. They're things that happen because of stuff, okay? <clears throat> and those issues cannot, because they were not foreseeable, they cannot affect your choice of forum. Okay. Okay. Questions? Yes. Given that there's a rule about the process of service, wouldn't it then be foreseeable that people would break that rule? Um, what do you think? Yeah. So let, let me ask you this, right? Do you think that um, do 
you think that a system of rules uh, can operate if it is assumed that the rules are broken. No, but you need to assume that people can and will break them. The obvious consequence is they have other rules that are broken. Is if you don't serve correctly, you can once you're having cases. Sure, but but I'm just saying that the summary we have is that it's foreseeable mm -hmm. as an outcome determinative issue, mm -hmm. and it's foreseeable that it's an outcome determinative issue because if you don't service properly, let me it determines the outcome. Let me ask. Let me let me phrase this question a little bit differently. Do you think that the plaintiff foresees that they will break the the rules on service of process? Means the client of work. They are a unit as far as we are concerned. Let me put it this way. Do you file a lawsuit thinking, ha ha, now I'm going to break the service of process rules? Right. And so, um, <coughs> and so do we, if it happens, right? Is that something that you anticipated at the time of filing? You define what's happening. If, if you break the service of process rules, did you anticipate that happening at the time of filing? No, I'm not sure. Any if, if you, as the plaintiff, did not anticipate it. Yeah. I'm not sure I would ever anticipate breaking any rule. Unless you're doing it on purpose. And... From that logic, we can conclude what about the federal rules of civil procedure? I'm not sure. Anybody? I think I think you've raised a really important issue and you you've led us to a really helpful conclusion, right? Mr. Booth is right. You don't anticipate when you walk into court that you're going to break the rules of civil procedure that that court operates under. And if the foreseeability is the turning point in HANA, what does that imply about the federal rules of civil procedure? Ms. Silva. Bingo. And that is exactly what the court holds in HANA. Okay, so thank you, Mr. Booth. That, that, this is a really helpful uh, conversation. Thank you for, for raising the issue. Okay. Other questions? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, Massachusetts had a policy reason for their service because they wanted it to be delivered to the executor of the estates. Mm -hmm. Does that matter at all for purposes of the analysis or it's just we are the federal government and the, the federal rules of civil procedure should apply because no one doubts our power here is there something i'm missing or um what do we think yeah mr chairman i i go on to the thought like you're not going to file this case <laughs> on the assumption that aha I'm gonna get them because when I file my process I get it handed to the wife of the executor. Like that's not why you're doing the thing. It happens just to be incidental and therefore it's an outcome determinative, therefore the Fed rules apply. It's like I think the stuff that we're talking about is we're focusing on the wrong thing. But you're not gonna file that case in that court just so you can do that thing. Therefore therefore it's good to go. I think that's an I think that's a useful alternative way of thinking about it, right? <clears throat> if the issue that is sort of in play in the case is one that is not the reason that you're filing the lawsuit, then very likely we're going to be in a situation where 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 Erie doesn't apply. Okay. And um to, to uh, Mr. Van Hee's point, right, that the state rule reflects a state policy judgment. I mean, I think 
the best answer I have to that is what's the limiting principle on that argument? And I don't think there is one. And so I think that um, the, the sort of, the conclusion that we reach there is that state policy judgments don't really enter into this, right? The, the existence of the Erie Doctrine is as much respect for state policy judgments as the federal courts are prepared to provide, okay? Um, and, and sort of, and so the niceties of like the particular policy choices made in these sort of very narrow niche rules, the courts go, whatever, man, right? Okay, other questions? No? Okay, <laughs> moving on. Um, Ms. Stewart, we've just spent, you know, the last 15 minutes discussing this modification of the outcome determinative test. So now I'm going to put it to you, for the purposes of the outcome in Hannah, does all of this matter? So like, I felt like the outcome determinative test in Hannah is this positive of the result. So like the way they reason is this positive of the result that they reached in this case. So they look to see if the state created right was substantial enough to afford protection. Um, and it discounts that the outcome would have been different. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the way they modified the test, I don't know. I mean, I got confused on this one. So, Mr. Knapp, go ahead. I was gonna say, if you're just talking about like the case itself, I'd say no. Why not? All your, the only thing that they're really talking about is if the case can be filed or not. So here is here is what Professor Bonner has to say about this, and then I'm going to tell you sort of where I think I disagree with him. Okay, what he says is he agrees with Mr. Knapp that the modification to the guaranteed trust test. Um, in this case, does not determine the outcome in this case. Um, we get some analysis in the case where the court talks about how, you know, there's not a big enough difference for this to matter. Um, it's hard, uh, as, as Mr. Knapp says, right, <clears throat> Adherence to the state rule would have resulted only in altering the way in which process was served. Moreover, it is difficult to argue that permitting service of the defendant's wife to take the place of any in service of defendant himself alters the mode of enforcement of state created rights in a fashion sufficiently substantial to raise the sort of eerie protection problems to which uh, the sort of equal protection problems to which the eerie opinion alluded. So we get this this argument that, you know, hey, this isn't enough of a big deal to be outcome determinative, which sounds like the court is saying, in fact, this modification to the test does change, does determine the outcome. But then the court comes along a little bit later and says, wait a second, we are dealing with a rule of federal law, we're dealing with a rule of civil procedure, which means that we have a specific command from Congress to apply this rule. And that trumps the Erie Doctrine's demand that we would otherwise apply 
state law, even if we found that it was outcome determinative, we would still apply the federal rule because it comes from a specific command of Congress. Okay. As, as to, to give you sort of the key language, the court has been instructed to apply the federal rule and can refuse to do so only if the advisory committee, this court, and that, that's sort of a, an important phrase, this court, and Congress erred in their prima facie judgment that the rule in question transgresses neither the terms of the Enabling Act nor constitutional restrictions. Okay. So, How often do you think that the Supreme Court says, oh, in fact, a rule of civil procedure that we promulgated violates the Rules Enabling Act? I will say it is not unheard of. Um, it is not impossible for it to happen, but it is rare. So, um, so this is Professor Bodger's argument, right? I think this is, I think that he's correct with one additional wrinkle, okay? Because as Mr. Booth has pointed out for us, um, we should apply the federal rules of civil procedure even under the test announced in Hannah. Right? So there is no, there's no world where the outcome in this case changes whether you follow the logic of the modified outcome determinative test, whether you build off the logic of the congressional command, um, they point to the same outcome. Okay. Questions? Yes. No, we, we, uh, service was adequate under the federal rules. And so the case gets remanded back to, to continue in its normal process. Yep. Okay. Yes. So, and correct me if I'm phrasing this incorrectly, but um, I mean, I won't hesitate, <laughs> <laughs> but it's the court essentially saying like, doesn't really get, this is like substantially affecting someone's rights. Doesn't really matter if it's like, oh, some, some procedure we can still do it. Right. And and so because the court makes the point that the guarantee trust test, the outcome determinative test, is over inclusive, right? Because it wipes out every conflict between federal and state law and simply says. There is no federal law where they can play, right? <laughs> because in any case, some conflict could be outcome determinative. And so what Hannah says is we want to figure out which outcome determinative conflicts are outcome determinative enough to meet the policy goals of Erie, which are what, Mr. Hoover? Uh, the policy goals, it's two of them. We want to avoid forum shopping and then the inequitable distribution of the law. Right. Inequitable application. application right? Yes. There. Yes. Um, <clears throat> absolutely right. Um, I keep going to you on that because you always get it right. <laughs> um, so we're, we're trying to figure out in Hannah what are, you know, what are the conflicts that 
impl implicate these two goals. Okay. <coughs> and what the court in Hannah says is if this is a conflict that, you know, at the time of filing would have led you to change your forum to avoid it, then we're going to apply the state law. Okay. And because of that, right, no rule of civil procedure is going to, to meet that standard because no party is going to, you know, look on the horizon of their case and go, you know what I'm going to do? I am going to screw up this pleading so bad that it fails to state a claim. No, nobody does that. Okay. <laughs> And so, and so the rules of civil procedure always apply. Okay. And then on top of that, we have the fact that the rules of civil procedure always apply because we have a specific command to always apply them. Okay. All right. Questions? Can you clarify your disagreement with probably not, <laughs> but I'll try. Okay. okay, so Professor Bodner says there are these two logics in Hannah, and one of them is dicta, and that's the um, and that's the the uh, forum shopping logic, and the other one is actually controlling the outcome, which is if there's a federal rule of civil procedure, you apply the federal rule of civil procedure. My point, my disagreement is that we don't actually have to choose between these logics, okay? Because the, um, the first logic, the first argument, the, uh, the argument that um, you apply federal law if the federal law would not create forum shopping also applies to the rules of civil procedure. Okay, so, so what I will tell you is that um, to some extent, this is a little bit of um, uh, straining at gnats, okay? In that, yes, you should recognize that there are two arguments being offered here in this case, and that either one of them is sufficient to reach the outcome, okay? The reason that we prefer the sort of congressional command rules of civil procedure is it is simpler, okay? We like, look, simple tests are great. Simple tests are easy. And so when a court gives you a simple test, you should appreciate it. So if I give you an exam question, or if the bar exam asks you a question that asks you to apply the Erie Doctrine to a federal rule of civil procedure, the answer is it's a federal rule of civil procedure. You use the rules of civil procedure. And you don't have to go down this other road. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Ms. Sorry, question. If we had that on your test, would we say like both of the reasons? Number one, because of the command from Congress, and number two, because the issue, this issue doesn't qualify as foreseeable, therefore we don't use it under Erie, or does it matter? 
Um, if you if you did it all, if I asked you this question on my exam, then um, probably you would get a uh, full credit for either argument, and maybe maybe a little bit of extra if you if you had both. Okay, and never apologize for asking a question. All right. Anything else? Okay. Moving on, and this, this next one's gonna be real easy, um, given what we've just talked about. Uh, so, <coughs> Ms. Duncan, what is the, is there, is there another test in HANA beyond modifying the outcome determinative test? Yeah. So it would be whether the law is substantive or procedural under the hearing document? How do we determine? How do we determine it? Yeah. Um, what what is the because because whether the law is substantive or procedural is the Erie doctrine. Okay. So the outcome determinative test is one way of determining whether the outcome determinative test is one way of determining. Good job. <laughs> um, I talk professionally. Uh, the outcome determinative test is one way for us to figure out whether law is substantive or procedural. But does the court in HANA announce an additional way that we can make that determination? Can we just call it effects the individual? That, that is still the outcome determinative test. Okay. Right? So okay. what have we just been talking about? Yeah. Pass on pass. Okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Holman. Okay, but just that the rules of civil procedure always apply. Yeah. The rules of civil procedure are always procedural so long as they are valid. Okay. Questions? Yes. Is that right. really a test then? If you just always apply the rule of civil procedure unless the outcome determinative test applies? Um so I'm gonna I'm gonna phrase that a little bit differently. You always apply the rules of civil procedure. That that's the end of that sentence. So then is it really a test or is it just that's how you do it? Well, prior to then, prior to Hannah, we didn't know that you always apply the rules of civil procedure. And the other thing is, like, like I said, right, there have been cases where the court has come back and said, in fact, this rule of civil procedure is not valid. Okay, and so there is there is room to attack a rule of civil procedure under the Erie Doctrine. And as we continue, um, the next few cases that we read will sort of look at even more subtleties involving this. So, so we're, we're, again, we're in the process of taking um, this relatively simple doctrine that comes out of Erie of federal procedural law, state substantive law, right? And by the way, this, this divide, not present in Erie, right? Appears in one sentence in Justice Reed's concurrence. But we're taking this relatively simple test and we're iterating on it and we're complicating it and we're developing nuance. And I regret to inform you that this is what you will spend the rest of your careers doing, hopefully not in the realm of the Erie Doctrine, um, but maybe, right, if you have to. No other option presents itself. Um, so uh, there's a hand over here. Uh, is there one last hidden caveat I guess you do multiply the federal rules of civil procedure. Is there not a hidden caveat of unless it violates the court? Uh, I think the answer to that is not yet. So, yes, I, I think that's my answer is that we will continue to develop how these twin aims of Erie 
affect how we view the rules of civil procedure. Um, but Hannah has, has taken this sort of categorical approach of the rules of civil procedure uh, always apply, okay? There was, was there another, Mr. Stromer, was your hand raised? Yeah, but. Did we, did, did we answer your question? No, you don't kind of. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, well, if you need more. All right, so what I pulled from was that I said no to the case. Like, they're pretty explicit that they always, I'll three words. So the case says pretty explicitly that this was always the case to apply the outcome to determine the test on a case by case basis to the wind of the policies on the line theory, dot, dot, dot. The federal rules of simple procedure should always apply. And they just reaffirmed that in this case. So I didn't yeah. think that was an additional test. So I don't. I, I I think you're right that like the court is is making that move of trying to paint this as um, we're not doing anything new here. This has always been the case. You always apply the federal rules. But then how do we deal with Reagan, where the court explicitly says we're going to use a state rule in place of a federal rule of civil procedure? I mean, that's that's probably the right answer. Is that Reagan is wrong? Is that if we if we think that Hannah is better as a matter of policy and as a matter of like choosing which law to apply in a given set situation, if we like the Hannah test, then Reagan is wrongly decided, okay, and should be overruled. Um, if we are trying to announce the Hannah test without having to admit having made a mistake in Reagan, which if we're the Supreme Court, that's what we're doing, um, then, uh, then we have to do some of this sleight of hand, right? And I think that identifying when the court is doing things like this is a useful skill for you to develop. Okay, so I want to, to so I think that this is something that's really, um, I think this is a really helpful conversation uh, and I appreciate you bringing it to, to our attention. I think that you're right that the Hannah court wants us to treat this like it's, you know, Oh, we're not doing anything special here, but they really are, because they're they're more or less explicitly contravening their own precedent. Okay. Um, did anybody see the habeas opinion that came down yesterday in the Supreme Court, Cruz versus Arizona? No. Okay. So I, I promise there's a point to this. Um, so uh, Cruz is sentenced to death um, and at the time of his trial, he asks for a jury instruction, instructing the jury that if they sentence him to life in prison, it will be without parole, right? And the idea behind this instruction is that juries may be more likely to avoid imposing the death penalty if they know that the uh, that the accused will never be leaving prison, right? Trial court denies this instruction. Um, and in a different case later, the Supreme Court says, actually, Arizona courts, you are required to offer this instruction. Like this, this is not, there's no room for argument here. If the defendant asks for a life without parole instruction, you have to give it. So Cruz files a, um, a habeas petition saying, hey, my trial was defective because I didn't get this instruction. Give me a new trial. And the Arizona Supreme Court says, well, uh, this decision came after your um, 
came after your taste. So you have to show that it's retroactive. And the way that we show that it's retroactive is, is we look for evidence that the, the court is saying this was always the law. You should have always been doing it this way. And there is that evidence. Okay. But then under the habeas statute, state that uh, habeas can only be granted if the Supreme Court has announced new law. And so the state Supreme Court says, well, if, if we were always supposed to be doing it this way, it can't be new law. And the Supreme Court says, actually, you can't force someone to make this kind to into this kind of like uh, catch 22. Okay. You have to provide a mechanism whereby when we instruct a state court on the constitutional commands of criminal process, that those who have not received the benefit of that process can obtain relief, okay? And in the same way, the court in Hannah is saying that the federal rules have always and do always apply Because we don't we don't care about the state rules of procedure because Congress has preempted them. And Congress has always preempted them since 1938. Right? This is a long way round to say that sometimes the court does not tell you what it is doing and why. Because sometimes they want you to think they're doing X when they are really doing Y. And part of your job as lawyers is to learn how to discern when you are being bamboozled. So, questions? Are we clear on what this additional test for the federal rules is? Although Mr. Adams is correct that it's not much of a test at this point. So, but it will get more complicated. So, <laughs> yay! All right. So, we come back here now. Oh, it's not in the question, it's in the answer. Um, so at one point, the court talks about when a situation is covered by one of the federal rules, the question facing the court is a far cry from the typical relatively unguided eerie choice. Okay. Ms. Gleason, what is the typical relatively unguided eerie choice that we're referring to here? Eerie referred to when the court has been instructed to apply the federal rule and can refuse to enforce the rules only when choosing between um, federal law <laughs> Only if they're an advisory committee, the court or Congress erred in the rule. Um, and in that, the rule transgresses either the Rules Enabling Act or the Constitution. So let me, let me ask you this. Yeah. The situation you're describing here. Right. Does it sound unguided to you? No. <laughs> so what would be an unguided eerie choice? If they didn't say what the conditions are, and in here we understand that it's an advisory committee that ordered Congress, but and it made an error. So, so let me let me pause you there because I'm. I 
think we're we're a little confused. Um, when you, because I I asked you just a minute ago, does the situation you're describing sound unguided? Who's doing the guidance? Is the court doing the guidance, or is the court being guided? That's a six of one half of the other question. No, it's not at all. It's the question of being, it's the question of being Dante or Virgil. <laughs> but if the, if the court is deciding and saying you have to follow these other people or these other entities, then. But if the court is the one that's doing the deciding. Right. Then who's doing the guiding? Because you can't be both Dante and Virgil. Right. So, so the court is Dante. Who's Virgil? The court is giving. <laughs> I don't know who Dante and Virgil is in this context. What? However, you didn't the court... read the Inferno? I, I generally. Come on. The... Wait, you guys don't know the 13th century classic of Italian literature? In no. <laughs> I, I apologize. To make but, the analogy. Right. So. Um, so the court is the court is telling further courts what to do, but they're saying use these other sources to determine that guidance. Is is let me ask let me ask you this. They're also saying the court should um, determine if those people made or if those let me, let me, made errors. Because I, I think there's I think part of the issue is that we've got a term that is floating in the air that's taking several different uses, Fair. which is the court. Okay. I okay. mean, the Erie court, specifically. But we don't care about the Erie court. We're, Erie is over, done with. We're, we're 27 years later, okay? So what? let's start with this. What is an Erie choice? It has to do with if there's forum or not, um, if there's forum shopping, right? No, okay. right? So what is, what choice is being made here? Where is here? And when you make an eerie decision, what choice are you making? Are we choosing federal or state law? Right. Yeah. Okay. So that is the eerie choice. Right is which law to apply, right. okay? If we are applying a federal rule of civil procedure, what guidance do we have for which law to apply? There's there's so much guidance, I guess. There's right, other, no, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right, right? But we don't we don't have to go down the rabbit hole of like enumerating all the guidance. There's a lot of guidance. Lot of guidance. Okay. So what would be <clears throat> what would be a situation where that guidance is not present? Off the top of my head, I would say something new, something that they hadn't anticipated, something in which there is a conflict of law. Let's just let, I mean, I, I don't disagree, but let's <clears throat> let's see if we can offer maybe an example. So um, yeah, there's not a conflict. What? I, I think that's what I put it. Sorry. I was gonna I was on the Amazon gonna buy Dante's friends in my when there is no conflict between state and federal policy, then that's the red relative to the guiding your issues. When there is no con if there's no conflict, then do we care which law applies? No. Potentially. Probably uh, potentially. Okay. Uh, help help me with that. You can tell a situation where we take the Supreme Court. I mean, you don't know until the situation arises, right? There's not a conflict, but you want theory to apply, but it doesn't apply. 
So I'm saying potentially because we never know. I mean, I think that if your legal strategy is we're going to go to the Supreme Court and create a conflict of law where one has not existed, <laughs> um, I would say that's a strategy that is a stretch. Um, Mr. Adams. I think what the question is getting at is that anytime there was a difference between state and federal law, the Erie choice would always prefer state law over federal law. And so that would lead to every court preferring state law from every example, which is the undivided Erie choice. I think you're, I mean, I think you're, I think you're overthinking this, right? I think you're on the right track, but I think you're overthinking this. Yes, Mr. Hamilton. Is that just a line between procedural and substantive law? So I, I'm going to stop hiding the ball for you guys, right? Because it, it seems, it seems like we're not getting this, right? The relatively unguided eerie choice is what we have already been doing it's it's that simple okay what hannah does is it carves out a specific piece of law being the federal rules of civil procedure and says you do not have to do a full eerie analysis here federal federal law applies if there is a valid federal rule of civil procedure that controls Right. For all else, that is the relatively unguided theory choice where we have to do this song and dance of substantive and procedural outcome determinative, essential functions of the federal courts, blah, blah, blah foreseeable, promotes forum shopping, et cetera, et cetera, right? You gotta do all that, all that fan dance in order to conclude whether state or federal law applies. Okay. And that's using the logic of not using forum shopping uh, analogy using your analysis on it. Because if I thought Hannah was using a uh, putting a check on the outcome to turn to the test and when to apply it. Yes, no, that's right. Yeah. So wouldn't that but it, it's an addition to the test. It's it's not a replacement for the test. But the unguided theory choice is is when you're is when you're using the outcome determinative test and asking about forum shopping and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Oh when it Okay, so if it does raise the level of being the substitute state right, then, then it's unguided. Yes. Okay. okay. Sorry. So, okay, okay. No, 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 no. Let me, let, me, let me make this as clear as I possibly can. Federal rule of civil procedure. You apply it. If there is not a federal rule of civil procedure that controls, then you are in unguided eerie choice territory. Okay. If you are in unguided eerie choice territory, then you have to do all the song and dance, forum shopping and equitable application, outcome determinative, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Clear? I'm not convinced that it's clear, but I appreciate you affirming. So. Questions? You good? Okay. So let's call it here. Um, so we'll pick back up with question 49 uh, on Tuesday. Um, Mr. Trump, do you want to just finish early tonight to get into the review stuff? Um, I think it's 57. After that, it's all. I prefer to do that. Do the review. 
Yeah, let's let's uh, plan to wrap at fifty-seven on on Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. All right. See you guys then. Take care. Don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you.